The British actor Bill Nye is one of the hardest working people in film. He currently has four films in the pipeline and a fifth, their finest, is about to open in Australia. It's the story of a British Army propaganda unit putting out material during the Blitz of London in the Second World War. Bill Nye plays one of the actors conscripted into appearing in the short films. He's best known for his role in the much loved and in some quarters much detested movie, Love Actually. Bill Nye popped by the studio earlier to chat. Bill, lovely to have you on the program. Thank you. In your new film, Their Finest, your cast is a past his prime, extremely pompous actor, which is about as far from you as one could get, so that's quite the compliment to your acting skills, isn't it? Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I like to think so. I did a lot of research, obviously, watching those other guys. But yeah, they, they needed someone to play a chronically self-absorbed, pompous actor in his declining years, and they came to me, <laughs> which uh, I can process easier on some days than others. Well, but it's a great part. Can you tell us about uh, the real-life research you did? Tell some tales out of school on who you well, based Well, to be work. honest, I haven't, you know, I, I, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm just lucky, but I've very, I don't think I've ever really come across actors, you know, I suppose traditionally, the, the thing that's entered the language is that they are, you know, they're difficult, they are deaverish, they are self-absorbed, they are, they crawl over each other's dead bodies to get to that role, they're sexually incontinent, none of which is true apart from the sexually incontinent part, obviously, which is very true. But no, I've never really met uh, people of that kind, really. Actors pretty much rub along together pretty well. In this particular um, role, your character Ambrose Hilliard dresses in a way that I would describe as maybe shabby dapper. Yeah. And I've read that you are interested in fashion and in the craft of tailoring and whatnot. Do you have any involvement in your roles with the look of the character and how they will dress? Yeah, I do, and it's very important because costumes make you move differently, they make you feel differently, they make you act differently, finally. Mrs Cole, uh, where is she? Cut. Could Those clothes were beautiful. Towards the late 40s, uh, I, I think everything has been downhill since then, personally. All the girls look marvellous in those tailored suits and they look uh, beautifully chic. And the guys, you know, that's when trousers were trousers. <laughs> One of the films in which you've starred that audiences have most enjoyed is Love Actually. Did you have any sense when you were making that film that it would be so enduring? No, not that it would be so enduring. I thought that it might be successful because it was Richard Curtis, because it was a great script, and you felt that uh, it would be popular because it was so good. But I, I don't think anyone was prepared for how it's kind of entered the language. You know, it's, it's now people use it for all kinds of purposes they have love actually parties you know people quote the whole film at me from what you know when i'm walking down the street uh, people run after kids used to run after me saying hey kids don't buy drugs become a rock star and people give you them for free and if i ever get anything on a tombstone that's probably what it will be um but who knew you know that it would be so enduring and so uh, sort of beloved and of course it's a christmas movie so therefore it, you know if, if it were that alone it, it's kind of become perennial Love is all around me, all around and me. so me. I'm afraid you did it again, Bill. <sighs> it's just I know the old version so well, you know. Well, we all do. That's why we're making the new version. You are a very busy actor. You work a lot. Is that by accident or design? Well, it's. I guess everything is sort of by accident. Uh, it's also by design in as much as, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that I get offered very good work, you know, it's stuff that you don't want to resist. Uh, people, people have accused me of workaholism and I'm always rather defensive, which probably means they're right. Um, but then I think, well, most people go to work all the time every day and they get a month off and that's their holiday and I get more time off than that. I get probably, you know, I don't know, a couple of months off a year. So I'm really, it's only this, it's just I have a different kind of job and people are aware of my job because they see me on the, you know, they'll be passing the telly or something. So they think, you know, I look, probably look busier than I in fact am. But uh, I, uh, I like to go to work and, I, th and I, I don't like the idea. I mean, I'm quite good at not going to work. I'm pretty good at loafing. I'm a pretty good, you know, we were talking before airing about bookshops, which is your enthusiasm, I know, and, and reading generally. And I'm very good at hanging around and reading and walking and drinking coffee and going to, well, I used to go to the music stores, but they're all closing down, and listening to music and going to bookshops, which is amongst, and walking. I love to walk. So I'm, I'm quite happy not working, but 
Uh, I just think it's probably good for the soul to keep going. So how do you, in your reading life, choose what you want to read next? I'm, I'm what they call, I think they call a completist, which is if I find a writer I like, I then go through the whole canon and I read everything they've written. Um, and I've done that a few times, More, most recently with A.S. Byatt, as we were to Antonio Byatt. And, you know, Martin Amos is someone I have to know what he's thinking. So, it, like, when, like when you were a kid and you went to buy the Stones album the Friday it came out, or the Beatles album the Friday it came out, I go and buy the Martin Amos book the day it comes out, uh, because I have to know. When you're very famous as you are, can you still be dazzled by other famous people? Like, if you met Martin Amos, would you be dazzled by meeting him? I would be uh, discomforted by meeting Martin Amos, yeah, because I know that he is, uh, he's, you know, he's an intellectual and he's a, he's a brilliant man. Um, I, I, and that might, I would find that daunting. It might be fine. I mean, I'm sure he's a very nice man. I've never met him. But, you know, uh, I, mean, I did meet David Bowie once, which completely threw me because I was and I wasn't prepared I was in a dressing room. I was in my dressing room when he came to see a show I was in in New York and I, I had no time to prepare not that I think it would have made much difference but I turned right there was a crowded room and there was literally nowhere to move and I looked around and there was David Bowie and I went into some kind of I can't even remember what I said but I went into some gush about how important he'd been through my development and all my early life and how I could never you know think of the words to be you know all that. and I could see his eyes just kind of because he was hoping to have a chat and it was a mistake I never made again and I got I was fortunate enough to meet him again later and I could be more relaxed and just say hi how are you you know how's things which is what they want but you sort of need the warning that you're going to meet him though so you can pre-game the talk so you're not that would help probably yeah you wanted to be a writer when you were younger yeah like everybody you know I read a book and thought maybe I could do that and my great passion was reading and it's, it remains reading and, uh, uh, and writing is what I, you know, it's, the, it's a large part of what I enjoy about my job, you know, when, it, when you get scripts and I love, you know, the, the thing that I get excited about is the writing. Um, as for being a writer, I failed at the first fence. I think I even, I ran away to Paris, you know, to be like those guys when I was 16 or something. I even sat in a room with a blank piece of paper and I think the doorbell went or something and that was the end of my literary career. And then, you know, I got drawn into acting and acting became a kind of form of displacement activity, actually. It's like what I do instead of writing. And I do... There are moments late in the middle of the night if you can't sleep and you're lying there and you think, I should write something. You know, I should have written something. Because I sometimes feel that experience isn't complete until it's recorded in some way. And the way in which I would figure to do that would be to write it. But I think it's a bit late in the day. These days, they do encourage you because it might make you know somebody a few pounds uh, to write a memoir of some kind. But I have I, you know the idea of it makes me want to lie down, and I can't remember much. So you know between those two things, I think it probably won't happen. Look, I feel like telling someone to, out the back to bring us a couple of drinks so we can just keep talking. But, yeah, let's, have, you know. let's kick back. <laughs> it's been lovely meeting you. Thank you so much. Charmed. Thank you.